This is Jack Jackson. In this video, we're going to talk about continuous versus discrete distributions. So we're going to start to see how we can transition from looking at probability uh, in the discrete case to probability in the continuous case. And so we're going to be building on the basic concepts that we developed in the previous unit or previous uh, playlist. But we have to slightly modify some of these ideas and techniques to work in the continuous case. So you're going to have a series of slides here coming up where it's like this, where we have discrete distributions described on the left and continuous distributions uh, described on the right with the corresponding uh, thing, whatever it might be. So we're going to start by talking about the random variable x. So material on the left should be review. Material on the right is extending this previous knowledge into our new situation. So on the left here, we see random variable x is, a, is discrete. What does that mean? Well, it means it takes on finitely many data values or a countably infinite number of data values. So uh, for example, a finitely many might be, for example, like a binomial distribution, which takes on all whole numbers from 0 up to whatever the sample size is. So it's, the x's are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to whatever n is. So if you have a sample size 6, the, the values are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's it. Nothing in between, nothing beyond that, no negatives, nothing bigger than the sample size, nothing in between. It's finite. We can actually write out the entire PDF and CDF table. Uh, there is a possibility in the discrete also that we have x is countably infinite. For example, in the geometric distributions we saw earlier, um, the, the um, x values were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and they went on forever, but uh, they did not, uh, they have, there's no end to them. But again, they're still discrete in the sense, so if you, they come in discrete chunks uh, of data, and there are no values between these. So even though we can't physically write down the entire table because it goes on forever, we can write down, say, the first part of it, starting 1, 2, 3, and up as far as we want to go. And there are no values between the ones that we have. There may be some, the table may extend forever, and you can keep counting up, but, it, but there's nothing in between. Now, in contrast, on a continuous distribution, the random variable x takes on an uncountably infinite number of data values. For example, it might be all the data values in some interval, say from A to B. Uh, uniform distributions do that. Or it might be only for the positive numbers. Uh, Chi-square and F distributions do that. Uh, or it might be for all real numbers, like normal and T distributions. Uh, that's the case. In this case, not only can you never write it all down, no matter what representative piece of the table you might write down, there are always X values between those in any portion of the table. And so um, it's... it's um, you can still write down a representative piece of the PDF or CDF tables, but not only does it go on forever, there are lots of values in between. Now, what about the PDF, the probability density function? Okay, well, in the discrete case, the outputs of the probability density function are discrete, non-negative values. In the continuous distribution, the outputs of the probability density function, PDF, are again non-negative values. So that's the same. But they're, they're usually an entire interval of values consisting of uncountably infinitely many values, usually for these different y values, at least in most cases. What about the graph of, the, of a discrete PDF? Now, if you remember, we graphed the discrete PDF as a vertical bar graph. So here, PDF of x is the height of the bar on the graph at a given x value. And the bars always start on the x-axis and go up. The graph of a continuous PDF is not a bar graph. We use a smooth curve. Uh, well, sometimes it has some sharp corners or some breaks in it. But usually, at least in pieces, it's continuous and smooth, um, with y values being the value of the PDF. Okay, uh, and it's always on or above the x-axis for the graph. 
Now, what else about the PDF? How does that relate to probability? Well, in the discrete case, the graph of a discrete PDF consists of a series of vertical bars. The height of each bar is the probability of that corresponding x value. Now, the area of the bar is proportional to the probability that the random variable will equal the x value. Now, remember, uh, area is the width times the height. The height is the probability. So the area is the probability times the width. So if we take the area and divide by the width, we get the probability. We want the width to be the same on all the bars on the PDF graph. So you can, you can basically find areas of bars, add them up, divide by that common width, and you have the probability. So area is not probability, but it's close. It's proportional to there. If the width of all the bars is 1, then, the, then numerically speaking, the area of the bar is the same as the, um, as the height, which is the same as the probability. So again, we can add up the areas of the bars and divide by the common width to find the probability of events with multiple values of the random variable. But notice again, it's really the height or the output of the PDF that is the probability. It's a little different over here. We're basically going to take this area idea and generalize that. So the PDF graph consists of a curve and the area between that curve and the x-axis. So below the curve, above the x-axis, say between some x equals a and x equals b, is the probability that the random variable will take on values between a and b. Y values here are not probabilities. They just give us the graph. So let's put that into a picture here so you can kind of see what we're talking about. On the left is an example of a graph of a PDF uh, for a discrete distribution, one we're familiar with. This is a binomial with n equals 30 and p equals 0.4. So probably the success each time is 0.4. 30 trials, there are 30 bars. There's a bar here all the way from 0 to 30. Now some of the bars are so short we can't see it here, but nevertheless there are actually 31 bars here. And so we get this graph of this PDF. Now I've shaded a few of these bars, four of the bars, the bar for 14, 15, 16, and 17. And so the probability that x is between 14 and 17 included is the sum of the heights of these four bars. And since the widths are all one, it's the same as the area of those four bars as well. Normally it would be the area of those four bars divided by their common width. Since the common width is one, it is the same as the area. So the probability that is between 14 and 6, 17 inclusive is the sum of the heights of the bars, which in this case is also the area. Now, here's an example of a PDF graph with we, when we have a continuous distribution. Notice the characteristics we've talked about before. It's always on or above the x-axis, and areas underneath make probabilities. So this particular one is what's called a standard normal graph, which has a mean of 0 and standard deviation of 1. And the shaded area then represents the probability that the random variable x is between 0 and 2, inclusive. So areas over here under the PDF are probabilities. Hopefully you can see how that's kind of a natural extension in a way of what we have over here. But, uh, you know, if I said, um, you know, f of uh, PDF of 1 is whatever point uh, 1 something, 1, 3 maybe, 1, yeah, let's say 1, 3, 1, 2, 5, 1, 2, 1, 3, somewhere in there. So about point 0.13, let's say. That is not the probability that x equals 1. It's only areas that are probabilities here. So this is a little different than the discrete case. So one way we can think of this, though, is going from the discrete to the continuous case is this. So here we have a discrete distribution, a binomial in this case. Uh, this particular one is a binomial with uh, mu, which is uh, well, well, n is 80 and p is 0.5, so this one's perfectly symmetric. Uh, the mean is n times p, which is 40, so 40 is right here. It's actually this highest bar, 
is the mean, the median, and the mode all at once. And we see a symmetric curve here. Well, if we take the midpoint of the tops of all the bars and we connect them up with a curve and we kind of smooth it out, we get a curve looking like this. And uh, under the right conditions, that curve should be a, um, a, a PDF for a continuous distribution. This particular curve that we see graphed here is actually uh, what we're going to call a normal distribution. We'll talk more about that in much de more detail later. But a normal distribution with the same mean and standard deviation. Here I worked out the mean of 40 and the standard deviation using our, our basic formula for binomials, square root of m times p times q. If uh, p is a half, q is also a half. Uh, then this is 20 here under the square root. So the variance is 20. The standard deviation is square root of 20. Or 2 square root of 5 if you like your radicals reduced. Um, 4 point something on there. And so we get, uh, we get this, take that mean and that standard deviation, and we can do a normal distribution based on that mean and standard deviation and that's what you see graphed here as the continuous curve there for the PDF. So hopefully you can see that that's a, a reasonable approximation so you think about this as you let these number of bars get more and 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 more of them then you would be get closer and closer and closer to filling out exactly this area under this curve. Um, of course, one thing that's obviously true if you think about it just a little bit, over here on the probability density function, the sum of the, all the PDF values has to be 1, so you're adding up all the heights. Or in other words, again, take the area of all those bars, divide by the common width, and you have an area of, or a probability of, 1. It has to be 1. Well, since probability over here is area, the total area under the PDF has to be 1. Now, um, the output of the PDF function for a discrete distribution is the probability that the random variable equals the input value. It's also the height of the corresponding bar of the graph, and it is the area of the bar divided by its width. So the probability that x equals a is just PDF of a for that particular distribution. Now, we get something weird that kind of happens here uh, for, for the discrete, for the continuous case. Now, since probabilities are represented by areas between the PDF and the x-axis, okay, so let's look back at, the, say, this picture here. Again, we're looking at this area. Well, what would happen if I, if I put this, say, not... Uh, not from 0 to 2, but say from 1.5 to 2. Well, it would be a little area here. Well, what if I did, uh, say, 1.9 to 2, a little sliver of an area? The probability would getting, be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So what happens if I try to get it exactly equal to 2? Well, in that case, when we look at our region, our boundary at the bottom here, right here is a line segment. But if, if the bottom and the top, instead of being 0 and 2, or just both 2, then what we've got here, instead of a region, is just a line segment. A line segment has no area. If it has no width, it has no, you know, it's 0 width times whatever the height is, is still 0. So that's a 0 probability. So we get this strange situation where the probability that x equals a for any particular a value is actually zero. There's no area, so there's no probability. So if I said, what's the probability that x equals 2? Well, it's zero. It doesn't matter which distribution it is. As long as it's a continuous distribution, that probability has to be zero. Now, we could have a problem that rounds. We could find the probability that x rounds off to 2. Right, so an x that rounds to two would be an x going from 1.5 uh, less than or equal to x uh, less than or equal to 2.5. So anything from 1.5 to 2.5, including the 1.5, not the 2.5, any x is in that way that range would give us a 
would give us a width of, of actually one for our little region that we're finding the area of, then that would potentially have some non-zero area, depends on the distribution of course, but if that part had a non-zero uh, area, then of course that would actually have some probability. So it may be the probability that X would round off to that uh, to would have a non-zero probability, but the probability that X equals two is actually zero. All right, now let's look at and remind ourselves of some of the notation here on the left. The probability that X is in the interval from A to B, closed interval, in the discrete case is you add up all the values of the PDF. So you take the PDF of all the X's, X of K's or just X's, so where those X's are in that interval from A to B. You find the values of the PDF, which are their probabilities or their heights of the bars on the bar graph, and you just add those up. Now remember that we use this capital Greek letter sigma. This capital Greek letter sigma is very much like our Roman letter or Latin letter capital S, standing for sum. So this is called the summation or stands for sum, which is just another word for add them up. So what it's saying here is we're adding them up. So we're summing up or adding up the heights of the bars. So you want to think of this as summing up the probability density. And those density, probability density comes in discrete chunks, one whole bar at a time. So as you, as you sum across here, when you come to some, some x in his, this part here that's between there, that's got a non-zero probability, you're adding the that whole bar at a time. Either you have it or you don't have it. You have the whole bar or you don't have that bar. If it's in that interval, we have it. It's added up. So the, it comes in chunks and I, a whole bar at a time. So I said this is like you know accumulating peanuts. You pick up a whole peanut at a time. Okay, now let's contrast that with the continuous distribution. Okay, so this is the probability that X is in the interval from A to B is the sum from A to B of the PDF of X. But the sum over here is this long skinny S. So the sigma over here is a Greek S. The long skinny S is called an integral sign. And it's, it's definitely an S. That's why that sign was done. And it's again, it still stands for sum. But it's, it's, the, uh, it's a sum of the continuous probability density. So it's a sum of areas under the PDF curve. So this is the area under the PDF curve from A to B and we're adding that up. In this version of what we're looking at we're going to think of this DX as basically notational which is telling us that X is the variable and we're just summing up this probability density. So again you want to think of summing up the probability density but this time the density comes in some kind of continuous flow like accumulating peanut butter. It's kind of spread out over there and you're, you're accumulating it in some kind of a flow, continuous flow. So over here in the discrete case, it's like picking up peanuts one at a time. In the continuous case, it's like picking up peanut butter that's coming in in a flow. But notice the, the uh, notation here is this long skinny S, which is called an integral sign. That's for summing it up. Okay, so the formulas look pretty much the same for your basic parameters. So the mean is the expected value of x. In the discrete case, that means you take the x times the PDF value of that x and you sum it up for all the x's. Well, the mean over here is still mu and it's still the expected value of x in the continuous case. But again, what you do is you take the x times the PDF of x and you sum it up for all possible x's, which is going from minus infinity to infinity. Similarly, the variance over here, sigma square, uh, in the discrete case, is the expected value of x minus mu square. So figure x uh, mu first, take x minus the mu, square them, multiply them by their probability, and add them up. So what we're doing is we're taking the x of k's minus the mu, square it, multiply by the probability of the corresponding x there, Take all these products and sum them up. And that's the variance. Of course, square root of that is the standard deviation. Well, similarly over here, the variance is still sigma square. It's still the expected value of x minus mu square. But over here, the expected value is you take that function, x minus mu square, we multiply it by the PDF, and we sum it up with this integral sign. 
So notice that these formulas are essentially the same in the discrete and continuous distributions, except that in the continuous distributions, the discrete sum, sigma, is replaced by continuous sum, integral sign. Now, um, let's go a little bit more, talk about the CDF, or cumulative density function. So the probability uh, that x is less than or equal to a is the value of the CDF of a in the discrete case. Exactly the same thing happens in the continuous case. So this is transfers with no problem. So the CDF of a is summing up the PDF of x's where all the x's for, for all the x's that are less than or equal to a. Well, summing up all the PDF over here is the integral here. And we go from forever left, negative infinity, up to the A that we're, we're at. So this would be, this is basically saying the interval from the A's go from, from or the X's go from negative infinity up to A. And that is exactly what we want there and just sum those up. And that will give us that. that. So notice, if you think about this as, an, as a, um, a graph now, of a function over here in the discrete case the CDF was a step function made up of a bunch of little horizontal line pieces of horizontal lines um, so it was started with a horizontal ray pointing to the left at a height of zero in other words on the x-axis and it ends with a horizontal ray pointing to the right at a height of y, y equals one so on the line y equals one and in between this the graph is a sequence of little horizontal line segments uh, open on the right, closed on the left, and they're they're basically steps. And the steps, so the breaks, discontinuities happen at each x value that has a non-zero probability. I'll show you a few examples here in a, in a few minutes to re remind you. In the continuous case, the graph of CDF is a continuous curve, which is non-decreasing and is always on or above the x-axis. It starts at zero on the left either on the x-axis or approaching the x-axis asymptotically as you go out to the left, and ends at y equals 1 on the right, either on y equals 1 or approaching the line y equals 1 asymptotically. Now, once again, let me remind you about the probability at a single point. Unlike a discrete distribution, in a continuous distribution, the probability x equals a uh, is equal to zero for any uh, specific value of a. So for a continuous distribution, it doesn't matter if we include the endpoints of an interval or not when we compute the probability for an interval. The probability of a less than or equal to x less than or equal to b is the same as the probability of a less than or equal to x less than b. So this includes the a and the b. This doesn't include b, but does include a. This next one does does include b but not a and the last one doesn't include either one doesn't matter which one of these you have you get exactly the same thing of course this is not true in the discrete case in the discrete case uh, if if b a and b have non-zero probability then all four of these things are different things and this probability would not be zero now I want to talk about a little sidebar just for a second about calculus and probability. The integral sign that we're using is actually something that we're borrowing from uh, a course in calculus. That notation is calculus. There's definitely some calculus going on in the background and knowing some calculus might give you some additional insights into certain portions of the units. However, it is not necessary to have studied any calculus before this introductory course. We're just going to use this notation and all you need to think about on the integral sign is it's a sum of a continuous uh, probability. Okay, It's just the sum in the continuous case and, any, and, it, and it relates to uh, areas under the curve. And so any definite integrals that we will need in the course we will approximate them by built-in calculator functions and they can be interpreted in the context of the course without any reference to calculus. Now, what I may do is I may put some optional slides or maybe even some videos at the end of this unit that bring out some additional information for those students who have studied some calculus. However, this material for my course is strictly supplemental and can be freely ignored 
for this first course in statistics. None of this material will show up on any graded assignments whatsoever. So for example, if you are a calculus student, this next statement will make sense to you. If not, you can completely ignore it. So notice that the for calculus students, notice that the PDF is actually the derivative of the CDF. It's the derivative function. And so that makes the CDF an antiderivative of the PDF, specifically the, the antiderivative which increases from 0 to 1. So we've got a derivative antiderivative relationship between the CDF and PDF. Again, if that statement did not make sense to you, then just ignore it. That's not important uh, for, for what we're doing in this class. All right, so here are some examples of the graphs of PDF or CDFs. So on the left, we see the typical example of a graph of a discrete CDF. You see the arrow pointing to the left here on the ray at on the x-axis, y equals 0. And on the left and on the right, you see a array pointing to the right at y equals 1. In between, we have some little horizontal pieces, which are steps. And so this first step occurs where they're actually, we actually get some non-zero probabilities. So the first time we get something that actually has a probability that's not zero is at 2. And whatever its probability is, is the height here it looks like about 0.2. And then it stays there until the next place we get some non-zero probability and then we jumps up by whatever the probability of 4 is up to this point. And it stays there until the next place we get a non-zero probability and it stays there and so forth. So notice all these are closed on the left and open on the right. The main points are these dots right here. This one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, which are typically the XY values that we put in the CDF table, the ones we're interested in. But we can actually define it for all reals like this. So what do you basically see? You basically see a function uh, It's defined for all reals here, and we see it increasing from 0 to 1, but it does it and, and definitely uh, has a discontinuity every time we get one of those discrete, discrete chunks of, uh, of probability that we're adding on. And so every time we get to, to a chunk of probability, boom, we're added up, we jump, we have a jump, a step. Okay, and so these, these pieces are not connected to each other. Now, on the other hand, a continuous distribution, Q, CDF, typically looks like this picture here. You still have an arrow to the left at 0 on, on this one, an arrow to the right at 1 on the other side. But in between, the whole thing is one connected piece, and it's either, it might be level for a while, but it never decreases. So it's either horizontal or increasing the whole time, and eventually it's got to increase from 0 to 1. So this is a typical way a continuous CDF looks. And notice it's the, con it's the CDF actually that's, that's actually continuous. Uh, sometimes the PDF is continuous in a continuous distribution. Sometimes it's got a break in it. Uh, but but the, the CDF will definitely not have a break. It will be a continuous function. So there's where it gets the name continuous distribution because it's CDF is a continuous function. So let's review a discrete case. Okay, so the CDF of A is the probability that X is less than or equal to A. So the Y value on the CDF graph, which is the red step function, is the cumulative probability. And it's the sum of the heights of the bars in the PDF graph. And notice here that we have the amount that is going up is by the amount of each bar. So here we have the x values, the PDF, where the x is, where the, where the probability is not 0. Of course, all those must sum up to 1. And then we see the values of the cumulative distribution here. Notice that if we took those bars and just shifted them up, uh, we get this. And you can see that the amount that the first one goes up is by the amount of the first bar. Amount the second one goes it goes up here for the step is the same as the height of that bar blue bar here which I moved up is this purple version and this this height of this bar is moved up is just right here and so forth. If you want to find probabilities here, let's look at a couple of things we can do. So, for example, if we want to find the probability that x is between two and six, 
that's going to be the y value on the CDF because that's the problem that's forever left that's that's from here so it's a probability to the left so it's just the y value right here so it's this orange distance from 0 up to this height is the the value of the CDF which is 0.75 it's that y value right there and it is this vertical distance but what is it it's the sum of all these green heights which is the sum of the heights of these bars or equivalently the sum of their areas and then divide by the common width if you want to find the probability to the right here something that's bigger strictly bigger than uh, um, let's say bigger than than 9 okay probably the x is greater than 9 well that's going to be the height of this this brown bar here which is 0.25 and so if you do the the CDF right below that up to just less than 9 say at 10 or here over it I mean uh, yeah up, up to 9 equals 9 uh, we get um, 0.75 here well what we want is 1 minus that which instead of now being this orange distance is the distance from 1 down to this this uh, CDF so it's the distance here so notice you can see probab cumulative probabilities or probabilities in general as vertical distances on the CDF graph so this orange distance from here to here which is the y value on the CDF is the cumulative probability or the probability to the left including this not and if we want the probability to the right, not including this, this bar, then that's going to be the height of this brown part right here, which is actually the same as the height of this bar right here. If I wanted to find the value between the two, uh, say between 3 and 9, okay, uh, in this case we're adding up bars at 4, 7 and 9 adding up their heights so we're adding up 0 0.1 0 0.05 and 0 0.4 which is 0.55 we can see that on the CDF graph on the PDF graph we see it as just adding up the heights of those three green bars or equivalently height adding up their areas divided by the common width if we want to see the the uh, the probability as a uh, we can see it as a vertical distance on the CDF graph. So notice we can go up to this point here at the top end at 9. That gives us this horizontal line across here. That's the same place we are for the height. The height here at 3 is right here at 1. And the difference between those is this green distance here. Between this height on the CDF and this height on the CDF is this green distance, which is, again, point. Five, five, it's equivalent to adding up those three heights of those three green bars is gives you that distance well this generalizes pretty nicely to continuous distributions. so now let's take a look here now here I have graphed both the PDF and the CDF like I did before so here's an example of something we would call a triangular distribution because I think you can kind of see why because the CDF I'm sorry the PDF makes a triangle the CDF is here. Now they're both zero on this part up to A. And then the CDF uh, increases concave, whoops, concave up at first. Somewhere there in here there's an inflection point, actually right here. And then it turns to concave down and then eventually gets to one and levels off. So if you pick a particular X value, then the X value here gives you a corresponding y value so this point here is 11 and 0.87 so that tells us that the y value is 0.87 which is this orange length and that is the probability that x is less than or equal to uh, whatever it was 11 so the probability that x is less than or equal to 11 is 0.87 it is this vertical length on the on the CDF graph on the PDF graph it's this shaded area so this shaded area is that there's no area here because it's on the Y on the X axis there's no area out here this area is here but it's not shaded so this area right here is 0.87 what would this total area be 
Well, this total area is the same as the y value here, which has got to be 1 by the time we get to the end. So a less than or equal to or just a less than probability, remember they're the same thing here. So the probability that x is less than 11 is the same as the probability that x is less than or equal to 11, which is 0.87 in this case. If you want to do a greater than probability, you're talking about the area on, under the curve to the right of this. So this would be this little unshaded area right here of this little triangle. So the area of that triangle, which is 1 minus the area of this shape, okay, which would be point, so if this is 0.87, that leaves 0.13 for this. So 0.13 is this probability. We can see it as an area under the PDF curve. We can also see it as a vertical distance on the CDF curve. This time it's not the distance from this point down to the x-axis, but rather it's the distance from that point up to the line y equals 1. So it's just 1 minus that y value, 1 minus the 0.87. So there's the probability there. If we want a probability between two numbers, Okay, under the PDF graph, it's a shaded area. So this is between, uh, looks like I've got, it looks like that's 11. So it looks like that's 10.5 and 11.5. So this would be things that would round off to 11. We get this little uh, right trapezoid shape, this little green shape. And its area, which is approximately 0.1317 in this case, that area is the probability that X is between, well, uh, 10.5 and 11.5 and that's what it is on the CDF graph on the PDF graph now on the CDF graph what is it well if we came up to here the y value here and that is the same as the area or probability from this guy all the way back which is the area of this unshaded region plus the green region so we want to uh, subtract off this unshaded region to the left which is the CDF value here. So we want to subtract these two Y values. Well, this Y value is this purple distance. This Y value is this green. So what's the distance? It's, it's this vertical distance between these two dotted lines or this green distance I have right here. So this vertical distance here is the same numerically as this area here. And they're both the probability that X is between 10.5 and 11.5. In this case, it's about 13%. So once again, <clears throat> let's do a compare and contrast. The PDF probabilities are, are sums of y values or sums of heights of bars on the PDF graph and the sums of areas of bars divided by the common width in the discrete case. In the continuous case, they are definitely just areas, areas between the PDF graph and the x-axis. In the continue, discrete case, cumulative the CDF gives you cumulative or left probabilities as y values. Same thing for the CDF in the discrete and the continuous. They're both the same. But probabilities are vertical distances of some kind on the CDF graph in both cases. So once again, on the continuous case, we have probabilities or areas under the PDF and basically y values are vertical distances. Cumulative probabilities are y values probabilities in general are vertical distances on the CDF graph. Some examples of named distributions that we have already studied for discretes are the discrete uniform, just a finite distribution where I just list out all of the things in a table, the Bernoulli, geometric, binomial, hypergeometric, Poisson. Uh, we've studied all those back in our last playlist in our last unit. The ones that we're going to mainly study in this unit on continuous distributions are the uniform distribution, which continuous uniform, triangular, exponential, normal, T, chi-square, and F. And the ones we see in bold, binomial, hypergeometric, normal, T, chi-square, and F, are the ones that are important for inferential statistics, which we will get back to later. Now, this has been an unusually long video for one of my videos, and I've thrown out a lot of information here. It may be that after you go forward and see how these things are used a little bit more, we'll reinforce some of these concepts. You might want to come back and look at these slides and or rewatch this video as we work through it a little bit. And some of this stuff will sink in 
a little bit more after you watch it and work with it a couple of times.